Uh, open up your Bibles to Ephesians. We're in uh, the book of Ephesians, 15 to 21. And uh, as you turn, I'm going to share a story. Um, so about two years ago, uh, uh, when our church was meeting in this space, and back then, about two years ago, uh, I would stand up over there, and uh, the, all the chairs would be, would be lined up uh, facing that way. It was, it was just this, this long uh, row of chairs. And uh, about two years ago, I remember uh, a young uh, Korean female uh, walked in. And she looked particularly lost that day. Uh, so lost that I spotted her and just uh, took notice of her. Uh, and I started to notice she was doing something interesting uh, during, the, uh, during the whole uh, worship gathering. Uh, she started writing frantically. Just a lot of different things. I was wondering, you know, what, what's she uh, writing about? As I walked past, I took a glance, and she was writing down literally everything that we were doing at church to the call to worship and the, the verse, uh, the songs and which songs that we were singing, uh, to the announcements, to the sermon, to the after the sermon, the response time. She was just writing frantically in this one bulletin uh, everything that was going on. I thought it was really interesting. So after, uh, after the service ended, I approached her and I introduced myself to her. And I just simply asked her, you know, do you normally go to church? Um, you know, what brought you here to church today? And uh, she said, this is my first time ever stepping, inside, stepping foot inside church. And I just wanted to see what Christians do. So I started thinking. I said, I, I, you know, I, I rewound and thought through. Okay, what songs did we sing? What, what verses did, he, you know, did we read? What did I say in the sermon? Like, if this is your first impression of church, I'm thinking, like, I hope we did a good job to help you understand what, what church is. And one of the questions that she had was, why do you sing songs? Ever wonder that? Why do churches sing songs? Across denominations, across generations and church history, across cultures and nations, when you step inside a church service or a church gathering, you will find that every church sings. Why? Do we do it because we just love karaoke, right? <laughs> and we just love to sing? Is it, is it that Christians are just created in such a way that, yeah, we just love music more than others? Why is it that we sing? And I know that some of us, we, can, we have some gen, you know, general answers, always sing to, to give glory to God. But why? Because we can worship in any way. We can worship through dance, right? Should we try that? Uh, we can worship in many different ways. And so why is it that, that churches, Christians, throughout church history, throughout generations, throughout cultures and nations, why is it that we sing? Ephesians 5 will talk about that. And before we read Ephesians 5, I just want to give you some background into what we're reading. So Ephesians was written by Apostle Paul. He wrote uh, to a, a church in Ephesus. So it's to this church that he will actually address singing. And it's to this church he talks about the gospel, this cosmic gospel, this God with his cosmic love. And so if chapters 1 to 3 is about that, that you were chosen from the beginning of time, redeemed in Christ, sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's this grand vision. And what Paul does so well throughout uh, these chapters, he opens up the spiritual to the physical. And he helps us see from the physical into the spiritual, oh, that's why I'm saved. Oh, that's what God did. Oh, that's what God did to my heart. And we see that over and over and over. And so it helps us understand, even from, from this side of our own view, we realize, oh, that's why I'm saved, because God actually had all this plan. But from there, he starts talking about, well, if you understand this, you're going to start to live differently. And that's when it gets a little bit hard for us, because we realize, oh, he wants us to love. Oh, he wants us to live differently. Our relationship with sex is different because of the gospel. And it's these hard uh, challenges that Paul gives to us. And today... He brings it and makes it very simple. And he says, yes, the gospel is grand. But you also understand, Christian life is hard to live. So he gives us a practical way to see that, 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 uh, that cosmic gospel regularly. This is uh, what he's talking about in verse 15. Uh, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise 
making best use of, of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, but for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the big idea today. The big idea is that singing is not pointless. Singing is not pointless, but what it does is that it awakens and deepens your faith. That's what it should do. And once you see all that happens, again, on a spiritual level, because with our own physical eyes and ears, all we see is singing. All we see and hear is someone drumming, uh, strumming a guitar, right? Sometimes you see someone strum a guitar really well. Sometimes you, you hear someone sing extraordinarily well. But what, what uh, he helps us see is what happens on a spiritual level when we worship. In verse 15, he says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. We have to understand the context of what that means. Uh, going back to verse 1, it's in the context of love. In verse 1, chapter 5, it says, walk in love. So when he says here, uh, be careful how you walk, he's now then asking you, church, how are you doing today with loving? That's the question that Paul would have for you. Think about it. Are you a loving person? Do you consider yourself a loving person? Because the call that God has for us is that we would love God and love our neighbor. So the question is, what Paul is saying is, well, think carefully. Look carefully then. Are you loving people? Or do you get frustrated, annoyed, impatient? Uh, underneath your, your breath, you, you complain. Maybe all your prayers are complaints about other people. There's no love. There's no, no, no patience for others. Are you loving God? Right? Do you love him with your heart? Do you, do you delight in reading his word? Do you delight in spending time with him in prayer? I think what I just did is discourage everyone. Because right? that's a reality. I think if you're really honest with yourself, you realize how challenging it is to love. And that's what he wants us to see. The call is no less. The call is never compromised. The law is never compromised. The standard is always the same. You have to love. So he says, look carefully then how you walk, how you love, because, in verse 16, the days are evil. The way that I would interpret it in the context of love is love, be careful how you love, because there's a lot of, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's very little love today. It's a, it's a loveless world. I think that's what he would say. I think that's what he's saying. Be careful how you love, because it's very hard to love, because very few people love well. I think that's the big umbrella of, of uh, Ephesians 5. And when we think about that, I think it's so true. Right? When I asked you, maybe I was to ask you, hey, let's go out yeah, to Soul Station every day and just try to find one person and really get, just try to get to know them. And let's say I gave you the gift of speaking Korean if you can't speak Korean. And so now there's no excuse. There's no language barrier. And I say, I'll give you the food. I'll give you the money. Let's go out every day and let's just, let's just love people. You know that one guy at work that everyone's annoyed of? Let's go love him. Let's take him out to, to lunch every day. I'll be there. I'll pay for the food. Chances are very few of us would jump at that, right? Because it's not a money issue. It's not really a time issue. It's a love issue. And I think that's what Paul is saying. That because the days are evil, because there's very, very little love, and there is very, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of challenges for us to love, be careful then how you walk. Be careful, uh, be, uh, be mindful of if you are loving. And then he continues on. Don't be foolish. Understand the will of the Lord. Um, it seems like this is maybe out of left field. What's he talking about? But I think it's very simple. When we don't want to love, we make excuses and say, oh, I, like, I can't do this. I don't have the time for that. But he's saying, no, don't be foolish. Don't lie to yourself. Understand the will of the Lord. This is the will of the Lord, that you love people. Don't fool yourself. And therefore be foolish. But understand that this is the will, to genuinely love others. 
Then in verse 18, it's, it's, the, it's, it's a verse that seems like it's literally uh, was copied incorrectly. It says, love, love, love. It's hard to love, love. Don't be foolish. And then in verse 18, so do, do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. For me, I'm thinking, what? Right? Like, where, where is this coming from? They're talking about love, and then out of nowhere, you just, hey, but by the way, don't drink too much. Do you, do you see the logical flow? It seems to be missing. But I think when we go back to the, the, the paragraph previous, as he talks about sexual immorality, and again, chapter, uh, verse 1, chapter 5, it talks about love, walk in love, imitate God and his love for us, Jesus and how he sacrificed for you. Imitate that, this cosmic gospel, if you understand that, you start to love. So if you understand love, you stop using sex inappropriately because you know what it, what it means to love properly. So as he talks about that, then he talks about, oh, the days are evil. Don't be foolish. It's hard to love. I think what he is saying here, I think he's speaking to the spiritually discouraged. To those who know the call to love, but we may have an addiction, right? There may be a sexual addiction. There may be something so deep within us, we try, we try, we try, we get the gospel, we're reminded, yes, God loves us, He forgives us, but on Monday, the struggle is real, and you try and try and you fail. And I think he is saying, that is why, I think in verse 18, he says, because I understand the call that is, that is so high, because that call is so high, saying, don't be foolish, understand the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord is to love people, so in verse 18, I think he is saying then, so when you fail at that, when you don't meet that standard, I think he's saying, at that point, when you're so tempted to escape, when you're so tempted to drink and get drunk and, and, and wash away your sorrows, he's saying, don't get drunk. He's speaking to the spiritually discouraged, the spiritually unmotivated, the, spiritual, the spiritually deflated person. That's who he's talking to saying, don't get drunk on wine for that is the pottery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In that state of discouragement, you have two options. Okay, when you're spiritually discouraged, you have two options. One is to escape. The other is to allow God to pick you up. Okay? When you're spiritually discouraged, unmotivated, when you got into a fight with somebody and you have no desire to forgive and you're trying to figure out how do I conjure up love, you have two ways. One is to escape, just drink, Netflix, YouTube, nap, good food, the list goes on, right? I can continue to go on. We, we, there's a lot of ways that we know how to escape. But then he's saying, but don't escape. Don't waste your time. Because the most important thing is love. Right, that's the greatest ethic. It's what actually the church preaches and what the culture preaches to love. It's in that mindset. For the mature believer, it's this. A mature believer is not one that never falls. I want you to know that. A mature believer is not one that never falls. Now, the fall may look different, but the mature believer is not the one that doesn't fall. The mature believer is the one when he or she falls, he knows how to get back up. That's the spiritually mature believer. Because the reality is, is, whether it's in action or in heart, or whether it's with our spouse or with our friend or with our kids, uh, the reality is, is, I think literally, many times within an hour, our hearts go astray. I think what this is saying then is not necessarily don't fall, because we live in a fallen world, the days are evil, but what I think what he's saying is when you fall, you need to learn how to get back up. You need to learn how to not just stay on the ground, but allow God to pick you back up. So in, in verse uh, 18, be filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, now he tells us how. Addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. How do you get filled with the Holy Spirit? You sing. Did you know that's what happens? When you sing with your mind and your heart, and you sing gospel, when you sing uh, biblical truths, what happens is the Spirit fills you. That's what it's saying. 
What it's saying is you cannot conjure up love. You cannot conjure up hope. Christianity is not this. If this is what you thought Christianity was, this is not it. This is not what Christianity is. It's not saying, oh God, I failed. I will do better. That is not Christianity. Do you get that? Christianity is not, oh, I sinned. I will do better next time. Christianity is I failed. I go to God. God, I'm sorry. God, you know my sin. You know my you, you confess. As you confess, the, 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 the blood of Christ washes over you. And what happens is as the blood of Christ washes over you, you are now filled with love, and then you go. What we're trying to do is like we're driving a car, and it runs out of gas. And we're just saying, just going to press on the, on the uh, gas pedal a little bit harder. Why isn't it going? And so now we get out of the car and we push. And that's what our spiritual lives look like. We're just pushing on. And we're just pushing on. I'm going to forgive this person. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to love this person. And they say something, you just blow up. And you're like, ah, oh, did it again. And that's what we're trying to do. When, when we have an empty tank, we're trying to love. When we have an empty tank, we're trying to love God. And when we sin, or when we fall short, we get angry, angry at ourselves, and it's this downward spiral. I think what he is saying here is don't get drunk on wine, so when you're in that place you'll want to escape. No, I don't want to escape. It's actually, it's in that moment you will understand the gospel most clearly. It's in that moment you say, man, this is really the state of my heart. This is really why God saved me and died for me. This is why I actually need forgiving. And so you go to God with that, and you let the gospel be spoken over you. You, get, you let God speak over you. He let, you let his love wash over you. And then what happens? There's a smile on your face. There's love in your heart. You go into work now that your heart has changed. And that's what he's talking about. He's saying, how do you push yourself spiritually when you have nothing in the tank? You sing. As you sing... God fills you with his spirit. So I want to talk about singing for a moment. What is singing? Right? What is singing? Is it just music? In verse 19, there's a word that's very uh, insightful. Addressing one another in, in, in psalms, hymns and, hymns, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody uh, to the Lord with your heart. Do you see that? With your hearts, not with your words. I would say music is a heart language. And you've heard different musicians talk about this, that where words fail, music is cross-cultural. And, and the power of music is that you don't have to have the same language spoken, but music is powerful because I believe it's a heart language. You know what Gloria Estefan said? The rhythm is going to get you. No, no, no one, no one, no one here. You remember that song by Gloria Stefan, The Rhythm Is Gonna Get You? It does, right? She was right. Like, it gets you. The music gets you. There's so many songs that can uh, spit out right now. And for some of you, you'll, you'll go right back into college, right back into high school, right back into that maybe that wedding day. Right? I could say, bye, 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 in sync. And immediately, all of you is like, oh, I remember where I was. I was in junior high. I was with my friends. You know? There's so many songs like that because that's what music does. It's, it's, it speaks to your heart in a way that words simply cannot. Uh, there's a, a song that was very popular uh, several years ago uh, called Happy by Pharrell. I think that's an iconic song in, in, that, in that, right? Where just the beat and the lyrics, you could be angry, upset, you hear that song, and just for some magical way, it changes your heart. That's the power of music. It's God's gift to us. Uh, in American Idol, uh, the show, uh, uh, you know, a music uh, talent show, um, in this show, uh, one of the things that the judges often critique the singer of is this. They'll often say, you know, you sing it technically perfectly. But they say often, oh, I didn't feel it. 
Because that's what music should do. You should feel it. And that's what music has a power to do. You could, we could, we could, uh, I can speak off a lyric that we just sang, but it's something totally different when you sing it. Uh, Dumbledore in Harry Potter says, Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. A magic beyond all we do here. A magic beyond all we do here. That's the power of music. It's the second uh, most commanded uh, yeah, uh, practice in scripture. There's 150 psalms. The, the psalms are the songbook of the Israelites. It's, it's an integral part of your faith. Psalm 57, 8, 9. Just awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. Why does it say awake? Isn't that an interesting word? Awake my glory. Awake, O high harp and lyre. And then says, I will awake the dawn. It's speaking to the power of music. You can read the Bible sometimes, and it's not hitting you. You know what I'm talking about? But then you could put on a song, and you could sing through that song. And for some reason, it's through that song, God starts to almost massage your heart, awaken your heart. That's what singing does. So when you come every Sunday, that's why we sing. Because we, we can't literally, physically massage our hearts, right? I wish we could, but we can't. And so what do we do? God gives us the gift of music to sing, and through singing, you can, you're able to... to uh, to shape your heart. It awakens the heart, but also it deepens the faith. It deepens your faith. When I talk about heart, it's not just about the emotions, as I, as I mentioned before. It's the place in your heart where your deepest commitments are. Right? It's the place in your heart where it's from this place you make your choices in life. It's from this place it's where your deepest loves and hopes are. It's because of this, this is why you move forward. And when it says in here that this is the place in which you sing, so much of the truth that we have here, because it's not actually in our hearts, we sing. And so as you sing a lyric, a verse, over and over, what it does is it shapes your heart and it deepens your faith. C.S. Lewis says this about, uh, about the power of psalms and music. I think we delight... To, pray, uh, to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but it, it is like the idea of you watch a sports game and when someone scores or someone sc and, and it makes a basket, what if I was to tell you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't celebrate that. Think about it. Everyone is, is watching the game, and they, someone you know, makes this amazing shot, kicks this amazing goal, and everyone erupts and celebrates, but you can't. How would, how would that interfere with that experience? I would say that, that, that moment when you stand up and celebrate, not only are you expressing the enjoyment of that, of that goal, but it completes it. Imagine I got tickets to your favorite you know, uh, band, uh, K-pop group, whatever it would be. Let's say I got, I got tickets to you know, BTS. I'm not sure if that's you. You may be the wrong generation. Blackpink, I don't know, Coldplay, whatever it would be. Let's say I got tickets, and I say, yeah, I'll give it to you, but you can't sing, you can't dance, you can't move. All you have to do is sit there. Imagine what that would be like. You go there, everyone is having a great time, and you just have to sit there. You're trying to enjoy, but you can't. You can't even bop your head, right? That's what it's saying. That's what worship does. It, it deepens the faith in your heart. And so some, some practical takeaways is one, sing regularly. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's a practical command that he gives us. One, sing regularly. I want, you to, I want you to see that this is spoken to a church. This is in the context of a church gathering. 
What he is saying is sing regularly. That word, uh, to be able to sing in here, it's not a one-time, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a one-time tense. It's a tense that is, is, is meant to be repeated over and over and over. And so the idea is every Sunday, if you're genuinely trying to love God and love people, what happens is every Sunday, you're a little bit hungry. You're a little bit wanting because you realize, realize how much you fall short. So literally every Sunday, you're coming to drink, to stir up your heart's affection. That's what it does. You should sing regularly, not just at church, but I actually encourage you to sing regularly at home, in your own walk. You don't have to sing loud, right? But to sing regularly. Uh, I shared this in the morning. Uh, one of the things that I do is, uh, you know, when I get into a fight uh, with someone in particular that I live with, and uh, when, I, when I get into a fight and there's no resolution, we've talked and we talked and there's no resolution, I'm still angry. I still feel like I'm justified. I am right. I, you know, I, I feel like you know, this is injustice. Like, you know, in those moments, I still tell myself, why? Well, I still need to love. I still need to be patient. We need to agree to disagree. But it's so hard. If you are honest with yourself, you've found yourself in those moments. And what I try to do is, okay, I just need to forgive. I just need to calm down. I just need to go for a little walk. And there's a lot of times nothing happens. You know what I'm talking about? You pray, God. There's nothing. There's my heart still anger. I'm still holding on to whatever I hold on to. And one of the things that I, I resort to is I sing. I put on a song where I just go for a walk. And you know, in Seoul, it's, it's so loud that you can like, hum underneath your own voice and, or you, know, you just kind of hum and no one really hears. And so I'll actually do that. I'll go out and there's like people all around me. And, but I just, I just sing a, a song, a song that's gospel, that has gospel truth. And I find that when, I've kid, when nothing else works, that's what works. I remember a time about seven years ago, uh, again, same illustration, uh, I was uh, in an argument with someone I live with. And, uh, and this person I live with uh, is my wife. And it's someone I love. Um, but it was at a point in our marriage, it was very dark, seven years ago. I actually didn't know how can we stay married for the rest of our lives. It was, it was really, I think, dire. It was probably our lowest point. I went to church, and it was at church before the word. And, I, you know, I've been going through it. Was, it was probably a few months of this. And uh, the sermons weren't speaking to me. Um, but nothing was working. I felt like the community that I was with wasn't really, uh, I, I, I felt like available for me. But God broke through one day, and it wasn't through a sermon. It wasn't even through a friend. It was, I was sitting in the front row, because I'm a pastor, and I was sitting in the front row, and it was the voice of the church, just singing this one truth of, of, of a lyric. I just remember, like, you know, uh, tears streaming down my eyes, just finding hope through the truth of what the church was singing. It's powerful because on a spiritual level, God's touching the heart through the song, through the voices of the people. With our eyes and ears, it's just us singing. It doesn't all sound very good at times, right? But I actually believe one of the most beautiful sounds God hears is not when the great opera singer sings. It's when the redeemed, brokenhearted sing. I think he delights in the church, which is the practical step number two. Sing at church. Sing regularly, but sing at church. You may not be good at reading the Bible. You may not have a good practice for that. I would say one of the steps, that if, 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 it, if that's hard for you, learn to sing. Just put on a song and, and sing. But also sing at church. It says, addressing one another. Isn't that interesting? Yes, you sing and make melody to the Lord, but it says before that, how do you be filled with the Spirit? You address one another. I experienced that so many times in the story that I, sh I just shared, but so many times. It was just by, by about, about six months ago, or six weeks ago, I was standing right here. You just remember the church just singing. And I just was so humbled by the love of the people in this church. 
because what you see, what, what's represented in each voice, it's not just a mediocre voice, right? And each voice that sings with passion is a heart redeemed, forgiven. That's why they sing. That's why we sing. You see, uh, at our church, I want you to know this, uh, this group up here is not the worship team, right? They orchestrate the music, but they're really just the music team. I want you to know the worship team before God is you. Do you know that? It's you. God is not waiting for that guitar player to, to do this crazy riff, right? He's not waiting for the, the, the awesome singer to go on this crazy yeah, thing. But it's God longs for his church gathered together singing truth. To God, that's the worship team. And I promise you, when we sing with passion, there are people in this room getting healed. There's people in this room, uh, different struggles are, are being broken. When we sing to the Lord, there's something spiritual that happens. Even if we had the best singers and best piano players and guitar players, if they were up here and they're playing so well that we start to take our eyes off of God and, and, and at these people, you know what I would say as a pastor? We're not doing a good job. Because the goal of the team up here is for you to sing. And so even today, when we close, my encouragement to you is sing. Because by your voice, not only is it pleasing incense to God, it's a ministry to one another. But you may be thinking... I'm a bad singer, right? That's not me. You know, I like the word, I like truth, but that's not me. Um, one of the people I, I've, I've been most blessed by uh, in worship is uh, a friend of, my, friend of mine, uh, Sahid, uh, who is uh, from Africa. He's probably like 6'2", like thick, thick, strong guy. Uh, we did missions training together and the church that I was at at that time, missions training literally was also physical training, so we would run like three or four miles. At that time, I was in great shape. So I was always number two, though. And someone was always number one, Sahid. I mean, he was like a man's man, right? Like, like you know, I just appreciated so much about him. He just did everything well. He knew the Bible well. And then when we would worship, I just imagined that he would also sing well. And I also imagined that he would just know what good music is. And I remember the first time hearing him sing. The guitar strums, the piano plays, and he is just off key, off rhythm. I'm like, what is this? But as he sings, he's just passionate. I just remember always being so humbled, not because of his great voice, his love for the Lord. That's my challenge to you. If you love the Lord, every time you come here, just sing. Don't be worried about, uh, am I on key, am I off key? Just sing. Because your passion to the Lord will be a ministry to somebody else. So when you come to church, sing. Lastly, sing wholeheartedly. Psalm 63, 4 says, I will bless you as long as I live. I will, uh, and in your name, I lift up my hand. Some of you come from a more charismatic background, and so you're actually very comfortable lifting up your hands, maybe even bopping your head a little bit. If you come from a Presbyterian background, like this is a little bit much, I know. It's like, whoa, what are we doing here? Uh, but I believe it's this. I don't think there's any one right, right, right way to worship. But I do believe it has to be wholehearted for you. So if you are the, more, the kind of person that's a little bit more reserved, you don't like to move, that's fine. But my encouragement to you is learn to worship with your body, to open up your hands, to sing. Maybe when your spirit really moves, you can you know, put your hands up. What that does is, not only uh, does it, I believe, actually shapes your heart as you shape your own body, I think it shapes your heart, but also not just that, I believe it's a ministry to somebody else. Because I know so many times, seeing not just Sahid, but another friend, if they, if they just sing, it's a ministry to me. I think it's actually, in one sense, very selfish to say, yeah, I'm not a worship person. 
I just want to come 15 minutes, you know, after you know, it starts so I can get, get here for the sermon. I would say that's, I would say selfish. Because you may not be a great singer, but if you love the Lord, bless somebody with it. By your conviction, by your passion. Sing wholeheartedly. Learn to, I would say, even use your hands and your body. As we close, I want to help you see now how Jesus does this. Because you'll be surprised that even Jesus sang. Did you know that? Jesus sang. The, the verse is not up here, but Matthew 26, uh, 30 references Jesus singing hymns. Jesus worshipped. He was not too holy for worship. He did not see it pointless, but even in Jesus' heart, there is something that happened to his heart when he sang. That it, 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 uh, it stirred, I think, affections for God. But Hebrews 2.12 is the verse I want to I close with. Hebrews 2.12. This is a, a verse that speaks of Jesus. It says, I will tell of your name to my, to my brothers. This is in the, in the words of Jesus in one sense. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. There is so much packed in this one verse. But there's a few things I can just distill for you. What, what the writers of Hebrew is saying is one, that Jesus is trying to minister to us through the song. He's trying to minister to us through the song, specifically that he's calling us to join him in worship. Because he says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. I think it's referencing you know, Ephesians. You sing to the Lord, but you also sing to one another. I think in this, as, he, as, as, as the picture is that he's in the, in the congregation, and as he worships God, I think his voice, his song, is a, is a call to others to worship. I will tell of your name to my brothers, to you. And so Jesus sings. When we sing, I believe Jesus sings and calls us to worship, but not just that, he stands in the midst of it. He is one of us. He does that, and I want you to see this, he does not just stand and receive, but he says he stands in the congregation to worship. Why? What does that mean? What theological implication is there? This verse is taken from Psalm 22. Psalm 22, in the beginning, says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the words of Jesus on the cross. Do you see what he's saying? That psalm, Psalm 22, as Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What he is saying is for the first time in history, God the Father and God the Son, that relationship is broken because our sins have been put upon Christ. And it's in that he says, now, not my Father, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And later on in that psalm, it talks about the crucifixion, it talks about the resurrection. And now when he says, I am in the midst of the congregation singing, he is now telling us the reason you and I the reason we can sing, the reason when we struggle with sin, when we struggle with different uh, sexual addictions or any kind of addiction, whenever, whenever we fall short from that standard of love, he's saying the reason you can still confidently sing is because of the cross. Psalm 22. So every time you come here, you are claiming the blood of Christ. And when you claim the blood of Christ, no matter how fallen you are, nothing will separate you from that. Nothing will separate you from his love, from his blood. And so my encouragement then is, especially when you are broken, especially when you are hurting, especially when there's no hope, come to church. And when you feel like you can't give anything to the Lord, when you feel like you can't make any commitments to God, just receive the ministry of that brother, of that sister singing. And what happens over time is in your heart, there's joy that's restored, love that's restored, peace that's restored. And as we sing, Zephaniah 3.17 says this about God, the Father. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. 
He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. It's a picture of a parent, right? We see our child doing something great. We embrace them. Good job. But this is even more. He sing, He sings over us. I believe as we sing, God in one sense sings over us. It's this do what, right? It's this, it's, it's this interplay of music, of love. That's what I think happens every time we sing. That's why I sing. I don't actually love singing. I actually never sing. I never go to the karaoke bar. I hate it. But I do it because I've learned that. And even as, as, as this verse ends, uh, in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for, for Christ, that also seems a little bit out of place. But I realize I have to humble myself to sing here. Right? I know for some of you it's like, I've never done this before. Singing at church, it's a little bit weird. It is weird because you don't do that anywhere else besides concerts. It's a unique social phenomenon that happens here. That you sing to the Lord. You humble yourself so that you could be ministered by other people through their song and you minister to others as you humble yourself to sing. Did you know that there is no other religion that writes as many songs as Christians? None. I mean, there's others, other religions sing songs, but in terms of percentage and purely the amount of songs that's written, it's not even close. Do you know why? You ever uh, watch, you know, any of those like dance competition shows? And then if it's like, you know, this, there are these shows and, the, and the, 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 the person or the group that auditions, when they are accepted to the next round, what do they do? They celebrate, right? But they celebrate with their bodies. The reason I believe Christianity writes more songs than any other religion is because it is a religion founded on good news. The good news is not you're not going to fall. The good news is not you're going to do it better. The good news is when you've tried your best and you realize how much you fall short, God is good enough, steady enough, faithful enough to rescue you. And so every Sunday you can come, no matter what you have done, if you plead the blood of Christ, you can uh, sing his praise and you'll feel his presence in that moment in your life. That is why, church, we sing. So let's close and let's sing.